very warm welcome to this CNBC Africa special broadcast from the World Economic Forum for Africa. I'm Wally Famirua. Thank you for joining us. And of course, the theme of this year's forum is forging inclusive growth, creating jobs, a big topic in Africa today. And um, as we continue to look at those issues and today's Africa Business Agenda Breakfast, hosted by PwC, we'll be looking at the big issues around doing business in Africa, the realities and the perceptions of um, corporate leaders on the continent. And joining me to explore this big topic is Collins Coleman, the CEO, uh, Managing Director at Goldman Sachs for Africa. We also have uh, on the set today, Devakuma Edwin, the CEO of Dangote Cement. We have Shola David Boha, the CEO of Stambik IBTC Holdings in Nigeria. And then last but not least is Uche Oji, the CEO of the Nigeria Sovereign Investment Authority. Of course, these are investors in Africa, and they will be giving us some interesting perspective about how business is done on the continent. Thank you so much, um, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And Colin, I want to start with you and getting your take about the whole perception of growth in Africa and why so many CEOs have uh, responded in the recent PwC survey as suggesting that they see growth, they are very optimistic about the future. Is that far-fetched? Is, is there enough of a reason to be so optimistic? Can I just get and give us your thoughts on that point. Well, I think the optimism reflects a few things. Firstly, the fact is uh, Africa represents 15% of the world's population and 3% of the world's GDP. Secondly, we, are, we have a track record in the last, uh, the years since 2000, of growing at 5.5%. We, Goldman Sachs, project that growth in sub-Saharan Africa to be 6.5% to the year 2030. That would add about $12 trillion of GDP to the world's economy between now and 2030, and that's one of the largest incremental GDP contributors to the world uh, going forward. This means that people looking at a current $2 trillion economy uh, are looking at adding $12 trillion by the year 2030. It's a fantastic opportunity, and that's why we see sovereign wealth funds, multinational corporations, African companies, indigenous to the home markets, uh, Brazil, India, China, very active, uh, and we're seeing a growth of two things. One is the exploitation of natural resources on the continent, and two, the exploitation of the demographic dividend of right. Africa, the rising consumer and the need to address that. All right. David Kuma, I want to hear from you. Your business is invested in 15 African countries. Your take about the growth story in Africa, how real is it for you? Well, uh, before we made our uh, plans to move out of the country, uh, country to various African countries, we made a similar analysis as what uh, my uh, friend pointed out. One is there is a huge growing population. And number two, the age of the population, median age of the population is quite low. And uh, so there is a strong consumer base. And if you see the per capita consumption of any product, whether it is fertilizer, whether it is cement or anything else, the per capita consumption is quite low. So there is a huge headroom for growth. Right. So these are some of the key drivers which helped us to decide to go out of the right. sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, Shola, I want to hear from you as well. I mean, you are engaging that consumer story in Africa. How real is that change that everyone talks about, everyone talking about Africa rising, the consumer story, the rising middle class? As you engage consumers um, in retail banking in particular, what are your, um, what are your experiences there? Certainly it is real and there's an increasing trend um, for the consumers to get more and more sophisticated in the demand for financial services. Um, I think the growth story it, it talks about two perspectives. One is in terms of financial inclusion, trying to get more of the informal sector into the financial um, system, and also the fact that there is a growing um, customer base. And this customer base is more sophisticated, more demanding in terms of having efficient and um, convenient services. And we certainly have seen that growth in terms of our expansion into the retail market. Right. Um, Uche, your experience and your thoughts on what you're seeing. I mean, you're investing in companies, hopefully on the African continent. Your experience about how those companies are engaging um, the, the continent and the opportunity it provides. Sure. Thank you very much. Now, I would say that um, our experience has been uh, justified uh, from all these statistics we've seen. Um, we are investing uh, in Nigeria in the infrastructure sector. 
and we've chosen five sectors where the opportunities we have seen. Um, and, and so far, uh, you can go back through some of the statistics um, that you read about, and, and, and the actual numbers bear them out. I'll, I'll speak to a few sectors. I'll speak to a stock investment we made in communication uh, two months ago. Uh, we bought a chunk of a privately held communications company. The numbers are just really fantastic in terms of what you're seeing. Uh, healthcare, we've made some commitments in healthcare. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, some of the statistics we've seen, about 30,000 Nigerians spending a billion dollars on, on medical tourism, of which 60% of that is spent in four areas, in cardiology, in orthopedics, in renal and cancer issues. If you invest in those areas, the returns actually start to look very, very interesting. Right. Uh, we're investing in motorways, we're investing obviously in real estate. So having said that, my perspective is very narrow to Nigeria. And, and I will say one thing, um, I'm very, very optimistic, more so now than when I started this job 18 months ago. Right. Uh, if you look at some headlines, uh, I still remember this very clearly, 10 years ago, um, the headline on The Economist magazine was Africa, the hopeless continent. Uh, the headline two years ago was Africa rising. And the interesting thing is if you go through all of that, the reality is that people will tell you that the growth will accelerate if we fix certain aspects of infrastructure. Right. Second thing I'm seeing that makes me feel very confident about the growth in, in Africa is the financial market is getting more and more sophisticated. You are seeing certain areas that we never saw in size 10 years ago grow. Private equity is growing. Venture capital is rising. These are things that I believe will actually be surgical in terms of the contribution they make to right. working growth in Africa. So I look forward and I think that things will be really fantastic. Right. Um, Devukum, I want to come back to you about looking at Africa as one opportunity and not just one country. And you've clearly uh, demonstrated that. And your experience about, uh, about the opportunity that Africa provides as one continent, one market. Well, uh, it's very easy to replicate the business models because uh, though specifically culturally you can see a lot of differences, in general the business culture is the same. So we find it very easy to replicate the business model. But we, coming back to the question, this one uh, continent, I think uh, in yesterday morning, the morning program, my president raised this concern that uh, inter-Africa trade is still very low. But, uh, trade uh, between Africa and outside, and inter-Africa trade, if you see, the percentage is very low because the borders are still not very freely open. Right. which is something which we should focus upon to improve the business and to make Africa one global business village. Right. So you've, you've highlighted the borders. Um, Uche mentioned infrastructure is a big issue. Colin, your thoughts about the other issues that companies in Africa have to deal with in, in approaching this opportunity. The opportunity is clearly there. Um, we're looking at the consumer story. We're looking at the growth story. We're looking at the resource story. But clearly there are other issues here. And from your engagement with corporates on the continent, how are they adapting to these challenges? Look, I, I mean, the story is really high growth off a low base with very weak institutional frameworks uh, and, you know, many logistical uh, problems for companies. If you're in a retail company, you're an infrastructure company, you're a mining company moving goods through ports, uh, etc., cross borders, uh, there are many obstacles to, uh, to getting a free flow of uh, goods and people uh, through the continent. And so uh, this is a matter of building it brick by brick. You know, right. if you take ShopRite's expansion uh, in the continent or MTN's expansion in the continent, these are or standard banks. This is a case of building branch by branch, building, uh, you know, tower by tower, <laughs> building shopping center by shopping center. They are property owners, ShopRite uh, in Africa and property builders in order to become retail providers, which is their core business. Yeah. Uh, and they have to manage the logistics, they have to manage the cross-border environment, the ports, getting you know, all, the, all the products to market uh, in a very, very challenged environment. Mm -hmm. And this is why margins in, South, in, in Africa broadly are higher. Right. Uh, if you look at Dangote Cement, you know, they're providing cement uh, at very significant margins. And this is why the companies are doing so well and are rewarded in high multiples because these margins are rewarding the fact that they're going, getting over a lot of obstacles in order to get their product to market. Right. So this is not, as I say, Africa is not for sissies. Uh, it's, a, it's a case of looking at the opportunity uh, and realizing there are lots of problems that you have to overcome. 
but the rewards are there. All right, so it's a tough place to go. Um, Uche, I want to hear your thoughts about whether or not you think corporates on the African continent are a little too conservative. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, it could be looked at as, as one market as opposed to just one country, one region. So your take on that, and um, clearly we've seen success with MTN, Dangote Cement. Do you get the sense that we're not seeing enough of that, if you like, entrepreneurial or risk-taking um, spirit on the continent? No, I actually think the opposite. I think that there is a lot more entrepreneurism going on um, today. And, and I think regardless of the resources you have as a country, the most important resource you, you need is human resources. Mm -hmm. And what I have seen in the last two years has been a big influx of people who have been trained in other places who, for many reasons, be it because there's been financial crisis in Europe and the United States, but also maybe because people are seeing the opportunities back home. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more entrepreneurism going on. You're seeing more of Africans solving African problems. Uh, mobile money, Africa is far ahead. And part of it is because it's an Africa-specific problem. So there are many things I'm seeing. I think entrepreneurism is one reason why we must be very, very optimistic about Africa. Right. But I, I still get the sense that we're not seeing enough of those stories. No, you, 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 I, think, I think it's, again, we're coming up a little, like Colin said, we're coming up a little base. So there's, there's a lot, and I think there's things, um, you get to a point where there is a tipping point and, and, and have a network effect where this thing starts to really grow in a big way. But there are things that need to be solved. And I'm, I'm just going to touch on something uh, that the CEO of Dangote said. Uh, when Europe integrated, um, it was very interesting. To ship a good from uh, Belgium to Spain, you needed 55 permits. Now you need one, right? These are things we need to fix right. to make sure that goods move very freely. Somebody was telling me that it takes 43 permits to get certain things from Nigeria all the way through to Kutuna. Some of these things are things we need to move to actually allow free flow of goods and services. The second thing we obviously need to fix is transportation. Right. Going from Abuja to Cape Town can be very difficult. Things like that are things that we will have to fix. And then I think, and they're not significant in terms of how, uh, uh, but the impact will be quite significant. Okay. So my sense is we're coming up from a low base. I'm very, very optimistic about entrepreneurism. In fact, that is what I think is the reason why. So you anticipate a lot more of these types of stuff. Absolutely, I do. All right, Shola, but let's talk, focus a bit on the local markets. You're playing in one of the largest, Nigeria, and um, the opportunity to create new products and what that, what that engagement is doing. I, I know, for instance, in the case of Stambic IBTC, over the last few years, you focused a lot more on retail banking. Can you speak to the experience of taking that risk into a new, into a new area? Huge challenges, I imagine, but can you just speak to your experience there? Very interesting and insightful, and we've learned many lessons in engaging with the retail market. And the most important thing is actually listening to the customer, trying to understand what their needs are, and then tailoring a product to address that need. And um, especially in the lending space, where you know we've put a lot of focus on the SME um, sector, and you know the challenges with that sector, they don't have financials, they have you know, um, poor capabilities. So we've actually had to um, go out and partner with um, key businesses who are part of a larger value chain you know, that we can help support and help achieve um, you know, a win-win situation. And um, what we found is that focusing on trying to optimize their cash flow and um, ensuring that we give them the appropriate type of financing that they need has actually enabled us to um, grow our loan portfolio in that space quite rapidly. Mm. Um, Colin, I want to hear from you about the trends we're seeing in terms of um, anticipating what customers need and perhaps borrowing from what we can see elsewhere across the world. Do you see a lot more of that happening in Africa where, for instance, companies are providing new products that didn't exist before? Um, really um, addressing the taste and the changing um, taste of African consumers? Yes, I think uh, there are many examples. I mean, I can think of a company uh, in Nigeria called Chi, which is providing uh, drinks to the mass market, uh, for example. You've got Safaricom, you know, with M-Pesa in Kenya, uh, introducing payment systems via mobile and phone networks. Uh, you've got Capitec and Equity Bank in uh, South Africa and, and uh, East Africa who introduce effectively you know, low income financial services uh, to poor people. Uh, you've got a group like PSG in South Africa starting a, a group uh, that is effectively providing uh, middle income 
uh, customers with better education than the public system can provide, so schooling systems. And then you've got the industrialization and consumer behaviors, whether it's the Heineken's, the SAB Millers, uh, or on the industrialization side, the cement companies and various others. Yeah. So it's, um, I think it's a case of a fast-moving opportunity set uh, where different companies are plugging in the gaps. I also believe, by the way, private equity is playing an important role in providing capital uh, into situations to grow companies. Uh, and they're bringing technology along with it, as are multinationals. Sovereign wealth funds are seeing this opportunity and are providing capital uh, to those opportunities. The one thing I would like to see before I retire <laughs> is uh, the development of some real equity capital market activity outside of South Africa. We really don't have liquid capital markets in Africa to provide uh, either the inclusion capacity for local populations to participate in these, in these stories, mm -hmm. uh, or in fact the capital, the liquid capital to the companies uh, to get this going. And that is one of the stories of China, is how yeah. they liberalized the market economy, they floated a lot of companies, they have established a $3 trillion market capitalization uh, in China from really nothing in 30 years. Uh, and you know, Africa, the Angolan market, the Nigerian market is not very liquid. Uh, Kenyan market is not very deep. You know, these are countries that are developing that are going to need capital, and we yeah. need to get those capital markets to function more effectively. Right. And Devakuma, I want to hear from you now um, about strategies to, to, to take advantage of this growth. Clearly, you have expanded across the continent. And uh, one, one item which I thought was very interesting, which didn't seem to be a big priority for many um, Afghan con companies in this PwC survey is M&A. And I want to hear your experience in that respect. Um, you've done a lot organic, of organic growth, and talk to us about why that hasn't been a deliberate strategy for you. Well, we decided to adopt the specific strategy of going for organic growth, primarily because of certain issues which we are adopting in our manufacturing business. One is, if you see most of the manufacturing companies in Africa, especially in the cement sector, yeah. they are all about 40, 50 years old. So the plants are highly energy inefficient. The uh, plants contribute a lot to pollution, and the plants have a very low productivity. So if you see our plants, cement plants, for example, uh, they are highly sophisticated. In fact, uh, uh, there is no cement plant in the world that can come and say, whether in US or Europe, that they have even in one department superior technology than what we have. So they are the most modern plants in the world. And that helps us to ensure that our energy consumption is one of the lowest. Our right. cement plant in Nobajana has the lowest power consumption in the world. And fuel consumption is quite low. So that makes us very highly competitive. All right. so and uh, yeah, another key issue is the quality. The quality of the product is far superior to that of our competitors. Mm -hmm. So one is our cost of production is very low. Number two, our quality is far superior to that of our competitors. So we are, any market we are able to, we are entering in, we are able to easily compete with our competitors. Right. Okay, Shala, your business, of course, uh, deal with M&A all the time. You advise companies that are looking at that as a strategy. He mentioned that because of the product he is involved in, it's not something that's really appealing to them. But he talked about quality, and clearly quality is what um, is something that you must always emphasize in an M&A deal. If the partner is the type that you want to go. Um, you want to combine with. So your take on why we're not seeing that many um, M&A deals on the continent, especially in Nigeria. We've seen quite a few, but it, it, it really looks like it's not something that's a deliberate strategy like we would see elsewhere in the world. Okay. Um, we get lots of inquiries, okay, but you know, not many of them translate into actual deals. And you know, we have seen a few, you know, you've seen the Tiger brands and Dangote, and uh, more recently, um, Abraj going into fan milk. Yeah. Um, and, and we will see more. I think there are a number of issues um, why you know, the speed of these transactions aren't coming through as, as fast as we would like. Um, one of them is valuation. Okay, and um, you know, there, that seems to be a stumbling block in, um, in the two parties being able to agree on a valuation um, figure to take the transaction forward. And, um, there's also a learning curve because you get many companies coming in from South Africa, Europe, who aren't that familiar with 
Nigeria, with Africa, and um, you know they need they need to get familiar with the environment, make a few mistakes before um, deals get done. Um, but we are getting lots of inquiries, and I think um, with the right advisors um, to help navigate all the regulatory hurdles, we will still see more. And also as um, the reforms in the various sectors um, take root, you know, it will throw up more opportunities for M&A transactions. Right. Uche, your thoughts on M&A? I mean, I know you have a very rich history in investment banking. Why don't we see that many deals? I mean, she has alluded to some factors. Your thoughts? No, I, I, I agree. I think maybe in addition to um, the issues of valuation, um, personally, I think there's also a cultural aspect to it. Um, and I think as we start to go through what one might describe as uh, shelter democracy and people realize that it's not so much about Uche and Sons, um, it's about right. actually building an institution, uh, an institution that can stand through time, um, you probably see more of that. Um, my sense is um, it, it will happen. Uh, but also the, the, the thing with valuation that I have also seen is over time, it has to do with the cost of capital. There's more M&A when capital is cheap. There's less M&A So does that speak to the need to develop our capital markets? There is, there's need to do that. There's need to develop the debt markets. Uh, because if you look at what drove a lot of the M&A you saw in the United States at the very beginning, um, I think sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, you saw that a lot of it had to do with the development of the, of the, of the bond market, um, right. which had always been developed. But then when, when the you know, low, high grade, uh, uh, when the low, low grade bonds actually became more institutionalized, that actually helped drive it. The point I'm making is that that was a source of capital that made things a lot easier. My sense is that I still think capital is still very expensive. And when you couple that with valuation fairly high, it makes it very difficult. And overlay all of that is a cultural aspect to it. My sense is that this, this time will come. But there's enough opportunity for organic growth still, in my opinion, that at some point uh, we'll right. probably start to look to M&A to as a way to drive growth. Right. Colin, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Maybe, like you mentioned, organic growth is still where we need to focus on, given the level of development on the continent. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I was just going to comment that uh, the financing market is really the area where you'll find banks most active in Africa because companies, you know, whether it's a Zenith Bank, we just did a bond issue for uh, in Nigeria, uh, in the banking systems, etc. The, the debt and equity capital markets is where the companies need, need most to grow. Uh, also, there are very few companies that are of a size that a large multinational can either partner with in a JV or buy, uh, you know, that are, there's not going to unplug a huge institutional um, uh, capacity from the market. You want to, you want to have own local company, have local companies operating. Yeah. So it, the, the larger M&A deals on the continent have tended to be either the South African companies which are, which are moving or, for example, Barty buying into uh, a large, a large uh, transnational company which they, which they did, they bought Celtel. Uh, and they've, they're operating that. But those are going to be few and far between. So the m and is going to be outside of South Africa, I think, few and far between. But financing is going to dominate in order to feed the growth of this market. In 20 years, we're going to have a much more uh, active so that, that uh, is still coming. market, you know, when these companies have developed from the ground. Okay. Fair point there. Um, I want to shift to another big issue here, which is some of the things that are hindering the growth. I mean, we're seeing good growth. Um, but especially for companies, um, one big issue of, obviously is infrastructure. And from the survey, clearly most companies think that government is not doing enough to address this. And I want to hear from you because you would need a lot of infrastructure, power in particular. And your experience is that you've actually had to invest in your power. Can you just speak to that point and to what extent it has reduced the potential of what um, Dangote Cement could be today? See, we believe in the philosophy that there's no gain without pain. So, uh, in uh, another clear uh, fact, which reminds when you invest in business in Africa, is that your total capex is going to be substantially larger than other countries because you're going to invest a lot, of, a lot on infrastructure. Right. I'll just take one of our cement plants, the flagship company which we have here in uh, near Abuja. Uh, when we started, 
we did not have water, the ground water. So, we had to go and construct a dam. Because in other countries, you can just depend upon the water bowl to supply you with water. So, we had to go and construct a dam. We had no gas supply nearby. We had to construct a 90 kilometer long gas pipeline to bring the gas to the plants. Right. Then we had no telecommunication for this facility. When we landed at the site, actually we were using Toraya telephones and we needed uh, satellite communication to get our drawings, everything on a regular basis. So we had to go and install VSAT communication facility. We had to construct 500 houses. So if, and we had to put our own 135 megawatt power plants. So any, and we had to construct the access road. And this is the same thing we are replicating in other countries too. We, most of the countries, apart from a few countries like Ethiopia, we are not connected to the grid. We invest in our power plants. We invest in road infrastructure. We invest in uh, water infrastructure. Everything we do ourselves. Because, uh, as, you know, in uh, Africa, most of the countries, you are given very good tax breaks on your ca uh, capital investments. So it pays you back. And if you are willing to invest, we are, we are sure to succeed. If you are going to be dependent upon governments to provide you with all the infrastructure, then apart from your, the fact that you may not succeed so fast, you are also looking for a lower returns. Why not invest in a matured market where everything is available? The returns mm -hmm. are low. So if you are going to be willing to take the risk and willing to invest, your returns are also very attractive. All right, Devakuma, I will have to... Uh, we'll have to hold it um, there for now. We have to take an ad break. And when we come back, we'll continue this conversation around the Africa business agenda. We are reaching you from the World Economic Forum for Africa in Abuja. We're back in a moment. Welcome back to our conversation around the Africa business agenda. We're reaching you from the World Economic Forum for Africa in Abuja, Nigeria. And just before the break, we were talking about the big issues that companies in Africa are, ha are having to deal with as they explore the opportunities on the continent. And joining us on the set now is Farouk Gumel, West Africa Advisory Leader at Pricewaterhouse. Thank you so much, Farouk, for joining us. Thank you. And Farouk, I want to start with you as we continue that conversation around the the challenges that um, companies are having around infrastructure. I mean, you've done the survey. Can you just give us a sense of your take on, on the changes that we're seeing in infrastructure and to what extent the companies are able to, to manage this change? Well, um, I think as Edwin mentioned, um, there's a lot of DIY mentality when it comes to the heavy industries. Mm -hmm. If you really want to go into a market and access what the market is offering, whether it's people, whether it's the commodities that are out there, or whether it's the potential you're assuming, yeah. You actually have to go in there yourself and deliver a lot of the background. Um, when investors come to Africa, a lot of them see government as uh, an entity that needs to actually provide infrastructure. But the question people don't ask is whether the government itself has the relevant infrastructure to operate efficiently. Right. So when you look at um, technology, for example, businesses have moved on. ICT is definitely being leveraged by a lot of private sector organizations, whether it's mobile banking, whether it's email communication between top executives and their staffs, whether it's branch connectivity through um, ICT. Yeah. Government, on the other hand, you walk into a typical African ministry, there's no computer, mm. there's no electricity. Mm. Communication between the top leadership and the doers doesn't exist. Mm. So if you're actually relying on an entity to provide you with an infrastructure that will improve your operational efficiency, then you actually have to look at that entity itself to understand whether they themselves have the infrastructure to operate efficiently, right. address your issues and concerns, and ultimately deliver to you what you require. Right. Um, I think Angote mentioned when, they went, when you go to government and ask them, it takes forever. Yeah. And it's very simple. So that's the reality of Africa. It's, it's just but um, Uche, I want to hear from you because you are investing in infrastructure, the sovereign wealth fund. And what, what would you say to African businesses? Um, should they expect the type of dynamism that we're seeing with Nigeria, with the Sovereign Wealth Fund, putting money in infrastructure. Many people will say we still need to commit a lot more, but at least we, it's a start. So your take on how companies should uh, adjust to this change, is it something that they should accept as it's coming from the government, or should they continue to be like Dangote and continue to, continue to make that investment themselves? No, I think these are, these are business decisions that every individual company will make. If your margins are high enough, to cover the costs of you providing your own infrastructure, 
and you know that the government, um, even if, as Farouk mentioned, have no real infrastructure themselves, uh, do not have the resources to provide infrastructure, um, then you should go ahead and make that investment because that is the right business decision to make. Um, the, the, the solution to this in many ways is something I think Nigeria is trying now, which is to have public-private partnership. And for that to happen, obviously, the regulatory environment and the legal environment has to be right. Yeah. We're trying something now in the area of motorways uh, with the government, and it's been quite an interesting experience uh, so far. But I think that I'm encouraged by the fact that there's a willingness to try. Look, the deficit is heavy. Africa needs $95 billion a year uh, in infrastructure spending, and currently it's something under $45 billion. Right. So that deficit has to be plugged somewhere. Um, making it easy for private sector to participate in infrastructure is one way. We're doing that in power. Yeah. Telecoms, is, but it's still very expensive. It will cost you five times per megabyte as it will cost you United States, in New York. And I did that because I just set up a company. Um, it will cost you, if you use diesel, it's five times per kilowatt hour in terms of how much it costs you to deliver power. Those things are still fairly high, which then ends up translating to much higher cost of goods for you. Right. However, the growth environment you know, continues to make it very compelling. The margins make it compelling. Companies that have the scale should do it. What I would say is that eventually, when the investment catches up, those are non-core assets that these companies will end up spinning back into the market. Yeah. And so I expect that um, short term, this is probably the way to go. Uh, but longer term, I'm encouraged by the solutions and the approach to try and fix it. Right. Shola, let's hear your experience as a bank, an investment bank, um, beyond the more obvious infrastructure like um, roads, power. What about things like technology? And to what extent are you adapting to changing technology in the world today? Yes, I think from the banking perspective, where we are meant to deliver financial services 24-7, it's critical that you know, we have our you know, branch connectivity very important. And more importantly, the reality is you have to have backups to all these arrangements, which is what makes it more expensive. And, so that's um, how companies really have to essentially adapt to this. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, because of the huge additional costs that you have to incur to run your business efficiently, any way you can um, have cost efficiencies, you've got to explore. So cloud computing, for example, you know, yeah. um, you know any technology that will make it easier for you to deliver services. Um, you know, so we're exploring various electronic channels you know, so you don't have to have so much bricks and mortar out there. It's right. cheaper to do so than to put up a branch with the power and water that you require. Right. Farouk, let's talk about technology and how companies in Africa are adapting to that. Um, things like social media, for instance, oh. it's a new wave. Um, from your experience as you engage companies, to what extent are they adapting to the changes ar across the world? I think um, Nigerian companies are actually, the private sector, very, very aggressive in terms of adopting technology. And uh, this comes back to the point earlier that when you were having the conversation with Colin about M&A, uh, yes, there isn't a lot of M&A volumes by value, but there's a lot of M&A volumes by quantity. If you look at the five to $15 million organizations in Nigeria, a lot of them are raising capital. And this is as, this is as evident by the private equity guys that are opening shop in Nigeria. You have the Carlisle's, the KKR, Standard Chartered Private Equity, Actis. They are all here. They are all looking at transactions. The big value ones are very rare to find, yeah. but the smaller ones. And these guys that are coming to invest in those smaller companies are looking to improve efficiency by putting technology in. It's a very simple thing moving a company from small to big in Nigeria. Just throw in efficiency measures, throw in transparency, and throw in long-term capital, and all of a sudden, that $50 million company two to three years, you're exiting it at $500 million. Mm. So technology is definitely something that private equity are looking at, leveraging into businesses, improving efficiencies. Right. And I think it's, it's definitely the future. Um, Dev Kumar, I want to hear about another challenge in, on Africa, in Africa rather. Um, the CEOs have said it clearly, talent. Attracting the talent, building the talent, retaining the talent. Share your experience at Dangote Cement. Um, I imagine that you've had to import talent to, to a large extent given the weaknesses we've seen in Nigeria? Well, uh, we import talent, but not to a very large extent, because uh, the businesses we are entering in, most of the businesses are very highly technologically advanced, so we do import talent. But 
I have found local talent to be extremely good. Again, coming back to the example I'll give you about my flagship cement company. When we started the cement plants, hardly apart from the uh, imported talent which you have brought to commission the plant and to have a startup, hardly seven of my staff had ever entered inside a cement plant. Really, there was no point for me to poach, go and poach people from the other cement plants because they are totally technologically outdated. So essentially, you have to train them from scratch. Train them. Same thing with my power plant. None of them had ever seen a gas-based power plant. We took them, we trained them, but the interesting thing is people are very highly adaptive. They are fast learners. Yeah. We took them before we started the plant, sent them overseas, trained them, and continued to retrain them. Now they are managing the plants very successfully. So now as we are growing very fast, still we, we find it a bit, bit of a challenge. So we started a, what we call a Dengote Academy. Right. So we take fresh graduates, diploma holders, trade test holders, and we train them. Now we want even upgraded to a university level. But that academy has helped. We continuously train people and they supply pools of manpower to our various plants. Yeah. There's been a very good success for us. Shola, I want you to also comment on this issue of talent and your experience in the banking sector. Um, it's a very knowledge-driven business, clearly. So your take on the challenge with talent, keeping the talent, training the talent. Yes, I think every phase of that is a challenge. Attracting, right. retaining, and engaging them. And um, I mean, particularly in specialty skills, you know, like market risk, um, advisory, you know, ECM, DCM, project finance. Um, there are huge shortages. It right. takes a long time to recruit. The recruitment process could be up to six months. Mm. And then you've got to ensure that um, you actually engage the talent, stretch them, um, show them a career path, and also train and develop them. Well, but, but if I can, sorry to jump yeah. in. I want to hear, especially about retaining, because that's usually a challenge. And from the survey, it seems it's all about money. Giving people money, that's the way you keep them with you. Yeah, money is important, but it's not everything. And you find out that you know, the brightest and the best actually are looking for transaction experience. Right. They want to be stretched. They want to be empowered. They want to be engaged. And they want to be able to see a career path in mm. terms of you know, what's, what's the next step. You know, so you always have to um, you know, be ahead of them in terms of giving them opportunities to learn and develop their capabilities. But ultimately, you know, the, the long-term solution is having sufficient bench strength. And we have uh, a graduate management program you know, that we've been running for a few years now, which essentially, you, know, you just hire fresh graduates, you train them, you expose them, and you have a sufficient depth to ensure that you know, even if a few leave, you know, they're sufficient to, to continue. So that's the long-term solution. Right. Um, Uche, I want to hear your comments about, on this point, as you look at companies that you want to invest in across the continent, your take on, on that challenge for companies. Um, as clearly, you want, you want to invest in a company that would have a succession plan, that's an institution. Do you see weaknesses there? And how do you see companies adjusting to this challenge? And one, 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 one area that clearly a lot of companies are beginning to do a lot across the continent is import that talent from overseas. Sure. No, I, I think that um, uh, I'm a little bit maybe one layer removed from this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll probably speak specifically to my experience and to the managers we have selected, their experience. Uh, for the NSIA, we're still in that honeymoon phase where it's easy for us to attract talent. Right. Uh, let's see how that sustains by the time people go through one full cycle, which in my opinion is three years, four years. Um, before you know, people go through the early phase of the excitement of a job, and now it becomes a little bit more, um, uh, um, I think, more routine in some cases. Um, so for now, people are doing really exciting things. They're picking hedge fund managers and large hedge fund products, uh, picking commodity managers and large commodity products. Some of these things are fairly new, and so it's quite exciting at, the, at this stage. And you have young people assessing $700 million infrastructure projects. So it's all looking very, very exciting. So at the moment. I think for us, it's been the excitement of the job and hopefully keeping it very interesting. As Joel has said, it's not just all about money. Uh, but when we look at the managers that we are, have, have assessed here, it's a problem. Right. We've rejected many managers uh, locally because of that uh, lack of depth of talent. Yeah, you, know, you cannot risk a multi-million dollar investment on just one key man. You know, that man gets um, 
doesn't show up, and then you have a problem with your investment. So it's one of the things we assess. Um, we went through a phase where we looked through many Nigerian managers when we were trying to award our equity mandate, and it was difficult. It was right. very difficult because you find it's just one guy, and the level below him are either not trained enough or not deep enough, and that is something that concerns me. If I'm going to hand you a $20 million investment, $100 million investment, I'd like to be sure that there's enough depth. Right. And, and I'm hoping that it's going to work. The feedback they all give me is that it's expensive. Yeah. We're now playing in the global market. You pay global prices. And in some cases, you end up having to pay premium to global prices because people come here and tell you the cost of living is very high. They provide their own electricity, they provide their own water, they provide, it's cheaper to live in New York City in some cases than it is to live in Abuja so for some of these people. So all of these things feed back. Um, but I think that um, um, over time, um, it will get solved. But right now, it is an issue. Right, if you can quickly touch another issue here, and that is the issue of how companies in Africa assess the environment around them. I'm talking about risk now, and Farouk, I want you to co comment on this point. Um, African companies, how they, as, how they are prepared for the changing global environment, oh. changing local environment, your experience? Well, I think um, it comes back to which country you operate in. Because there are some countries that have protectionist uh, approaches to, to certain industries to encourage local manufacturing, local production. And those countries, for example, the businesses, the local businesses that are already in those sectors are kind of hedged. So they're, they're protected. The government takes care of them and ensures that no external factors come in to interfere with that domestic business. Then there are other countries that have very much open borders where the barriers to entry are very low. And yeah. that is one of the biggest issues that local businesses are having in those countries because you'll be sitting there one day, you call the shots, you're running everything. Tomorrow, somebody with a higher capital base shows up and changes um, the dynamics of your market. In terms of risk itself, it comes back to how you perceive risk. It's all on an individual by individual basis. A lot of the domestic or local indigenous companies in Africa tend to accept local risk as just their daily way of doing business. They don't really look at it as an obstacle, whether it's political risk, whether it's uh, security-related matters, whether it's uh, currency devaluation issues. It's just part of their day-to-day -day operations. It's more of the international companies that come to us looking to enter this market. When they ask you to do market entry strategies or financial models, then all these things start to come up. And all these questions lead to a longer phase of due diligence because they are saying, well, what if the Naira crashes? What happens to the RAND in three years? How do I make sure that if there's a change in government, the political dynamics or the laws that are governing this particular sector change? What happens with the environmental issues that are happening to some of my other countries? So Nigeria could be a manufacturing hub. It could be the center for production. But the market or the consumption could be Cameroon. It could be Chad. It could be Niger. It could be Beijing. Now, if those countries have certain rules on the quality of the product or the process that that product is delivered, then it impacts you. And these questions typically happen to our, from our international investors rather than the domestic uh, players in, in those right. markets. All right. Um, I want to throw this open to the audience now. And at some point, I imagine that some, some of you all may also want to comment on that issue on risk. So I'd like to throw it open now. If you do have a question, please just signify by raising up your hand. We have a question at the back. Um, please introduce yourself and very quickly, to the point, ask your question, please. My name is Taiwo Yedele, I'm a task partner in PwC Nigeria. My question is around dealing with corruption and bureaucracy. Uh, because at the end of the day, whether you're big or small, for a lot of things you have to do on the continent, you need government. Either yeah. in form of giving you a permit or even dealing with paying taxes, for example. I'd just like you to share your experience about how you navigate that terrain. I think first of all, just I think corruption is an outcome, you know, and um, what you find is that as reform takes place in various sectors, those issues disappear. So you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted a telephone from NITEL, you know, you are looking for who to get it from. Today, you don't need to. So I, I think that issue of corruption as reform takes place will become less and less important. But having said that, um, to do business correctly and um, properly in Nigeria or I guess in other parts of Africa, um, you just have to follow the rules. And it will take longer because you don't want mm. to pay anybody anything. So the price you pay is time. You know, but you will get it through. Um, but 
The, the, the other thing that is re real is the fact that you have to build relationships, you know, and um, the price of building a relationship is that you might, you know, have to travel to Sokoto for somebody's wedding or do difficult <laughs> things like that, you know. But there's a price and a cost to you engaging with various um, parties in government, and you don't have to pay bribe or do anything that is illegal. But like I said, the price is time and um, you know, a few hard yards of doing things in you, right. you, you wouldn't normally want to do. David Kuma, I want you to also comment on this point because you are going exactly. across the African continent. So you've entered new markets, your experience dealing with the issues of corruption in Africa. When the overseas investors tried to portray that corruption is a major factor in Africa, it, I would look at it as a uh, pot calling a kettle black. Either corruption is endemic, it's everywhere, whether you try to do business in US, Europe, it's there all over the place. So corruption is an issue which you, you, you'll have to face and you'll have to manage. As uh, Mrs. Bora pointed out, one of the biggest ways in which you can manage is by building relationship. But most of the time corruption comes only when you want to jump the queue, cut exactly. short the practices, and or you want to get something which you are really not entitled to. Mm. So if you want to follow the normal route and try to just get what is available for you, you can go and manage easily without corruption. All right, let's continue. Go ahead. The one who has the mic asks the question. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think before I ask my question, I just want to state that uh, I don't believe there's any unemployment in Nigeria today because I believe everybody is an entrepreneur. And that's something that comes out every time I visit Lagos or Abuja. Um, we talked about private equity and the importance of uh, PE as a funding model. Now, the Carlyle Group just closed an Africa fund at $698 million. I've got two questions around this. One is, you know, with the lack of qualified investment opportunities, um, would you find us being in a state where we have a lot of money chasing too few deals? Mm. And the second is, private equity typically operates between a five to seven year uh, investment cycle where you are incentivized to disinvest towards the end of your cycle. Um, one of the biggest issues today is the lack of uh, development of financial markets outside South Africa. What are some of your exit opportunities uh, when you do get into uh, private equity investments? And of course, this would be directed to Uche from uh, Soviet Group. Absolutely. I think Uche, you're very qualified to talk about that. You're investing on the continent. I imagine you're taking private equity um, sure. commitments as well. No, so, so this is something we ask the managers we speak to. Um, some of the commitments we're making in private equity to local managers, it, it's an ongoing question. Um, how do you exit? Uh, unfortunately, what you're seeing is the size of the deals uh, tend to be quite small, and the exit, it's usually, you know, there's a stock market or there's a you know, strategic buyer who buys some of those things. My sense is this. I think you're going to see more and more of strategic acquisition of the opportunities you've developed. Um, and, I, and, and, and that is what I believe over the next three to four years will be the best way to go. We were having a discussion about M&A, you know, and the big companies look at this as too small. It's yeah. too much less of the effort. This is where I think private equity bridges that gap. Mm -hmm. Grow that company to a mid-sized exactly. company that is interesting for an S&P 500 company to look at it to acquire. That is how I see this developing in the short term. You cannot overnight expect the capital market to just develop. It's grown significantly in the last 10 years, obviously, but not deep enough to absorb the size of deals that will come. Yeah. Do I see some of you with a lot of capital chasing too few deals? Yes. And I see that because I think there is still a mentality that, you, that has to change in terms of uh, you know, minimum size of deals or what kind of deals you do. You might have to adjust that a little bit. When I took this job, I thought my role was going to be just to invest. Uh, there are three things I can do. I can be a sponsor of a deal, I can co-develop a deal, I can just invest. I wanted to simply invest, but that was never going to work. I had to back into co-development, I had to back into, in some cases, something I thought was anathema to me, which was to sponsor a deal. It's been a change in philosophy, a change in mentality, because you have to create your own deals. I think that what will happen to make sure that you don't have too much capital chasing, too few deals, is that you adjust the philosophy with which you work. Minimum size is come down a little bit. Uh, there's a little bit more work in trying to help this company. And, I'm, you know, it's hard because when I have this conversation, somebody said what I'm describing is a venture capital business. I said, well, I know the difference between the two, but the reality on the ground is sometimes you might just have to adjust your philosophy a little bit. So right. that's how I see it evolving with time, yes. 
All right, thank you so much. Uche? If I could add something to that. In okay, here, please, just, very quickly, you know, please, because I have quickly. to wrap very soon. Yeah, so in terms of the opportunities for the peace space, I mean, if you look at the rebasing of the GDP, you find out that there are huge segments of the economy that are not represented on the stock market. And that, that is a huge opportunity you should capitalize on. And one of the things, just to add to Ichi's point, is that you have to be prepared to actually introduce governance in these companies, oh. because that's the missing piece usually. And you know, once there's governance, you, know, you get a better outcome. All right. Unfortunately, I cannot take any more questions because we're out of time. Most sincere apologies. Thank you so much for a lovely audience. Thank you very much. As a great panel has talked about the big issues in Africa, um, looking at Africa business. The agenda has been set. Um, it is a great opportunity. A lot of companies taking advantage of the growth story here, and we've just dissected quite a few of the issues that they have to deal with and how they are coping with those issues. Thank you very much. I'm Wale Famriwa, and thank you for watching.